we are live. Uh, today's webinar is best practices for Oracle licensing to avoid an audit failure. Uh, I'm your host. My name is Sean Donahue. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Miro Consulting, uh, as well as the lead Salesforce analyst. Um, presenting our presentation today will be Wayne Federico, COO and VP of Technical Services for Miro. Switch over to slide two. All right. A uh, little bit about who Miro Consulting is. Uh, we're a leading global provider of software asset management and subscription management services for Oracle, Microsoft, IBM, Adobe, Salesforce, and Amazon Web Services. Uh, we specialize in license management, audit advisory, negotiations, ta negotiation tactics, support management, and cloud services. Uh, and our mission is to help our clients maximize uh, their ROI on their software license investments, uh, stay in compliance, and negotiate successful contracts and audit settlements. All right, if you have any questions, before we begin real quick, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the question box and we will answer them at the end of the session. We won't give out any information about who's asking the question, but we will read the question to the audience uh, so they understand the answer we're giving. Uh, with Wayne, I'm going to hand it off to you. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Sean. Um, okay. Let's get started by reviewing our agenda. Let's face it. The only reason anyone wants to keep their software compliance status up to date is so they're not taken off guard by an audit from the vendor. And this is particularly true with anyone using Oracle software. Most often, corporations have not looked at their software compliance status for at least several years. And if the IT environment evolves as quickly as it does in many organizations, an audit will result in some need to make an unplanned purchase of additional software. There might even be some penalties thrown into those settlements as well. Unfortunately, most corporations uh, can get out of touch with the status of their software license compliance because few are in a position to dedicate any of their staff to such a role. So today we're going to review some best practices for organizations to follow that will not only help them be better prepared for that inevitable Oracle audit, but also provide for additional benefits in leveraging that knowledge as the business and IT environment evolves. It's important that folks understand that waiting until you receive an audit letter um, is not the proper approach. Um, and unless you're in a very large IT environment that changes all of the time, you typically do not need to monitor your license changes daily. Um, the best approach really kind of falls between the two extremes. Okay, slide three. Slide three, or four, sorry, and yours. Next slide. Uh, bear with us one moment. Put us on or something. All right, there we go. Okay, uh, back. Next slide. Okay. Um, so this is to gather all con on contracts and uh, the latest support rules. Um, so for any licenses, uh, you know, basically organizations have been utilizing Oracle software for decades. So some purchases could be from a long time ago. Uh, this is why it's so critical that you pull together all these documents, either physically, digitally, or both, and store in a single place. Um, so when you have like original ordering documents, these are the documents that you know, is, comes with the very first purchase of software. And then any time you purchase it, right? So usually people have plenty of ordering documents. And in those ordering documents are gonna be all the details of the limitations and so forth um, for those particular licenses. Uh, then uh, an organization will typically have a master services agreement that pretty much is, is over and above a grouping of all of these ordering documents. Um, there may be ones that are signed every couple of years, um, over time, but usually there's just one active um, or uh, 
but you also have to look for addendums because addendums can come over years to be added to master services agreement. So all of that comes into play as well. Latest support renewals, these are the ones that usually are the easiest for people to find um, because you get them every year. Um, and uh, they have a listing of all your licenses and the, cost, the support costs for them, but they don't have any other details. So they might list something as limited, but they won't explain the limitation. Um, so that's why it's important to have original ordering documents. That's not always the case. Um, so, you know, people can work with just the late support, late support renewals, but ideally you would want those originals. Um, and then any sub subscription contracts for your Oracle Cloud uh, based services. Um, and then once all these are gathered, you know, you want to compile it into a list that you, know, you can basically document um, any limitations or conditions that exist with the licenses, because that's kind of helpful to understand um, uh, the way you deploy these licenses. So um, that's also something that's very helpful uh, to try and keep people from deploying what they know you have and not just deploying whatever. Because if you remember, Oracle uh, pretty much allows you to download anything without a license. So people have, can have stuff loaded and be completely unaware that you know, either they needed a license for it or that they even have a license for it. Um, and if some licenses were purchased a long time ago um, with the, the ordering documents missing, the latest annual support can be used to kind of like at least list out the licenses. You may not know, know all the original stuff, but it's something to go on. Okay, slide, next slide. Now, perform internal usage reviews annually. Ideally, it's best to confirm software usage and deployment twice per year, um, but once should be considered the minimum. Um, it's better suited for environments that change very slowly. Um, large environments often evolve so constantly that waiting an entire year to compile everything is too long. Um, and could definitely uh, be an IT resource train when you go to need to do it, right? Because then all of a sudden you got to pull a lot of people away from other stuff um, and, and make that the focus. Um, but if you start with a baseline review, then only document changes throughout the year, right? You kind of get all that stuff together at first. And then when you go forward, you're only documenting the changes that happen during the year. Um, it's much more manageable. Um, and it can often position uh, the organization to only have to catch up on less than like three months worth of changes should all of a sudden an Oracle audit letter appear. Um, so this way, if you're doing it periodically and you're keeping some track of things, then you may be a couple months out to kind of catch up on any changes in worst case, but if, if you're at least trying to kind of do it regularly, uh, you put yourself in a better position. Okay, next slide. Okay. Um, understand any conditions around entities, mergers, acquisitions, or divestitures. Since many organizations have owned Oracle software for many years, um, it's also common to find that these same organizations have gone through many acquisitions, mergers, or divestitures during those years. This can make compiling that information from all those documents rather confusing. Um, it can provide benefits, uh, can be proved beneficial to collect information on limits to certain licenses, the definitions of entities, access rights of entities, you know, what the entities are allowed to have access to, um, as well as any conditions um, that exist around execution of any acquisitions, mergers, or divestitures, um, because that's that's some of the stuff you know you want to kind of be able to be prepared for. Such information is it's useful to have in preparation of an audit, but it's it's just as useful to use it to guide changes uh, in the IT environments, and simultaneously verifying that any proposed changes might be impacted by um, any one uh, condition. So this way, when you're, if, if somebody knows a merger acquisition is being kind of talked about, you have something to kind of go to 
and reference and understand, okay, this is some of the stuff we may have to deal with. Um, and we, you know, one of the things like with the ULA contracts, those are uh, most often the, the contract that has the most customized language around acquisitions and mergers and divestitures. Usually it's, it's they're usually larger clients that have ULAs. Um, and so there's the, the odds of a acquisition merger or divestiture is pretty high. Um, so they put that language in, but they can be completely different from one ULA to the next. They can be very customized. So it, there's nothing to really go by to say, what's the common? Because there really isn't a common language. for it. Um, Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, maintain well-groomed user lists. Um, maintaining accurate user access information to your systems and applications, not only useful to prepare for a vendor audit, but they also help maintain security of your systems. Um, it's generally a fairly easy process to disable accounts of users who no longer work with the organization. Um, but you'd be surprised at how many organizations are six months or more behind on cleaning up those lists. Um, at the start of an Oracle audit, um, they will initially identify basically everybody who has rights to those softwares. Usually Oracle allows people to clean them up without a penalty. Doesn't happen all the time, but, but usually they, they're pretty decent with it. But just from the security perspective, uh, by keeping those accounts active, um, it creates a security problem. Someone could actually you know, get into them and start messing with your systems or data. So it really is a, a best practice overall to um, maintain those lists and keep them up to date um, and reduced to uh, just who's still working with the company. All right, next slide. Okay, uh, ensuring any cloud usage and compliant uh, is compliant and cost effective. Just about every organization out there utilizes a cloud platform for at least part of their IT environment. A hybrid configuration is the most typical configuration you'll find, unless it's recently a recently created small company that started out with all their IT resources deployed in the cloud, right? They're, they're putting everything in there and um, they, they don't put anything on premise. Um, often misunderstood, the cloud deployments are not immune to software license compliance concerns, uh, particularly if organizations are using a BYOL, bring your own license, licensing since it's entirely controlled by the organization and not the cloud vendor. So, you know, when you buy, let's say licenses through, you know, Amazon using RDS, okay, those are Amazon. So they're, they are only gonna be able to kind of utilize them um, in, a, in a typically compliant situation. Um, not all. So there, there's even situations like with prop hosting that can pop up issues. Um, if you don't already have prop hosting licenses to apply and you try to use RDS, which cannot be used for prop hosting. So there's, there's several different scenarios there. Um, if uh, it was also common for organizations to expect cost savings as a valid reason to shift to the cloud. It is not. Most organizations now understand cost savings should not be any of the top reasons to shift to the cloud as it will very likely not provide uh, savings in the long run or even in the short run in many cases. Um, as servers or instances are decommissioned within environments, you can shift use from on-premise and into the cloud, right? Particularly in a BYOL situation. Uh, but it's important to understand that in many instances with AWS and Azure, uh, particularly outside of Oracle's cloud, um, they can require more licenses to, to be deployed in the cloud than are required on premise. Um, so that has to be considered when you're making changes. Um, so that's another reason why tracking this stuff um, you know, prepares you the best to keep on top of that. Um, one of the main reasons organizations look to shift IT resources and solutions to the cloud is for the ability to rapidly deploy new resources, uh, which is indeed a valid reason. But strangely, many organizations do not spend much time on ensuring they're utilizing and deploying IT resources in the cloud in the most cost-effective manner. Uh, many have just recently 
solidified their cloud strategy, like choosing to be cloud first, right? Where they will first determine if it can go into the cloud. If it can't, then they put it on premise. And then the reasons it might not go in the cloud could be for technical reasons, it could be for business reasons, um, security concerns, you name it. Um, so the uh, so you need to monitor uh, the cloud usage so you can remain compliant with your software as the environment changes, and less so for an audit concern. You can also you should be monitoring it so that you can check the cost of the cloud use and optimize when necessary, because just the the costs of running those resources um, in those services you want to stay on top of because they have different. Um, ways in which you can get savings um, in that situation. And you don't want to be paying, you know, top dollar for everything um, that you put up there. Okay, next slide. Keep goals of ULA agreements in focus. Unlimited license agreements are another topic that's not necessarily a huge concern in leading up to a vendor audit but it should be a concern in preparing for the eventual certification of that ULA. Some people may still believe that Oracle does not audit environments that have ULAs, but they do. They do so for reasons not so related to the audit itself. Uh, Oracle is trying to get an understanding when they do an audit during a ULA. and They usually try to do it kind of in the middle of the term of a ULA, um, but they're trying to understand as to how uh, much the client has deployed under that ULA so they can properly uh, plan for its eventual renewal because Oracle always is looking to renew. Um, they, they, that's their goal. Um, when eventually, um, at some point, the certification will become necessary. But just as Oracle is trying to plan ahead for that renewal, the organization that has a ULA should be monitoring if they're deploying new environments that were the whole reason for the ULA in the first place. Uh, Oracle counts on the fact that most clients do not get around to deploying everything they intended when they negotiated the ULA. Unfortunately, when you deploy much less uh, than what you intended, it can make it difficult to certify because you only get the licenses as part of the ULA for software that is actually deployed. Um, so if you end up renewing it, it would not be an extension of the first ULA. It never is. Um, it would be for a whole new ULA. So it would be a whole new ULA with all new goals for what is to be deployed and, you know, and, and all the monies from the previous that were negotiated just roll forward. Um, uh, so because of the way the mechanics work in a ULA, you get left with licenses that have higher support costs than they should. Um, and this creates a situation where you end up with a higher cost of ownership than intended for the licenses you did employ, deploy. And that's basically because you set the amount of um, cost of the support for that ULA at the beginning of that contract based upon what is expected to be deployed. If you deploy less, then you, that price doesn't change. So you're still gonna pay whatever you first negotiated for except it's going to equate to much fewer licenses if you deployed much less than you intended, um, which is something you want to avoid. So it's critical for organizations to monitor their ULA deployments so they can get the most cost-effective value from them. Um, and it'll, it'll best position you to certify the ULA when the term does come to an end. Okay, next slide. Um, keep an eye on reducing shelfware. Another advantage to closely monitoring your software usage is the ability to know when you have used unused licenses available for use. No one should be buying new licenses if they already own them. Um, but if you're not keeping a running tally, you would never actually know. Um, this is obviously not important for the purposes of an audit prep, um, but it is very useful to keep shelfware at a minimum and maintain a very low, uh, very cost-effective software um, footprint. Um, okay, next slide. All 
Um, are tools useful? Um, and this is pretty much, uh, I, I couldn't complete this discussion without a comment about tools. Um, most organizations and particularly the people that, that work there would really like to spend as little time as possible worrying about software license compliance. So their initial desire is to find a tool that'll allow them to essentially ignore, um, ignore it until they get audited. Unfortunately, it's not how it works out. Um, it's because there's no tool that exists today that can cover all aspects um, of what we've discussed today. Um, sure, Oracle does certify uh, discovery tools, but the certification only guarantees that Oracle will accept the report from such a tool in order to gather the inf info for an audit. Um, but that guarantee only addresses database options and packs, nothing else. Um, so on top of that, uh, the tools cannot spit out a status of compliance because there are many licensing situations that are not countable by a tool, um, such as licenses required for proprietary hosting. Um, you know, that's something that is um, not an actual license. It's more of a special concession on a license. And that special concession gives you the right to use it in a proprietary hosting situation. Um, and that's a very particular situation that is, uh, does not have very, very clear and distinct rules because it can, it can um, involve so many different scenarios. Um, so it's something that uh, no tool could possibly know um, at all. So, um, so it's good to, you, know, you would have to maintain that information in a tool. Uh, to be able to mark the license requirements manually. Um, but most people, that's precisely what they don't want to do uh, when they have a tool. They'd rather it just kind of do everything, but that's just not reality. Um, can they be helpful tools? Yes. But generally in larger IT environments um, where there's often a, a shortages of IT people, um, but even then a tool cannot replace an IT person um, as the IT person would still need to maintain information within that tool in order to take advantage of the tool properly. Um, but those tools still cannot know how to navigate the rules of software licensing for Oracle. Small IT environments generally like to avoid the cost of tools um, since they can normally do a level of manual tracking without too much issue. So if any organization wants to consider using a tool, they need to identify precisely what aspect they need the tool to cover and understand that no one tool exists um, that can handle every need, particularly those that are specific to understanding Oracle software licensing rules. Um, I mean, the reality is Oracle adjusts their rules and the interpretation of their rules so often um, that it's, it's essentially impossible for a tool vendor to keep up to date their tool with any of these changes, because these changes can have like, you know, obviously, um, Oracle's not considering how difficult it is to change the tracking software to, you know, uh, for certain types of uh, licensing rules um, and, you know, especially interpretations. So uh, they're not thinking about that. And it can be very difficult for, to, and it's virtually impossible for a tool vendor to be able to keep up with uh, updating their tools. So the tools really, you know, as we often say, the tools don't know. Um, and, and they're never really going to know them completely ever just because of the way, um, particularly with Oracle. Okay, next slide is questions. All right, um, so before we get to the first set of questions, uh, I want to answer the one that we get most often when we explain this type of thing is, uh, how the heck am I supposed to do this? Uh, so, you know, you may be wondering, like, you know, how are you supposed to know all these rules? How do you know when things change? How, how do you know uh, that you're really seeing all of your assets and does it match what your contract says? Uh, and I can tell you, it, it is very difficult uh, because it's typically not what you hired your IT staff to do. You hired them to do the normal things they do every day. Um, even the largest organizations in the world uh, have a lot of trouble with this. Well, that's where Miro can help you. Uh, we have a managed services program uh, where we basically take care of all these things for you. Uh, we work with your team. 
Uh, we make sure you're in compliance. We make sure you're going to pass your next audit. Uh, and I do mean it, that is a matter of when you get audited, not if. Um, usually uh, Oracle audits its customers every three to five years on average. Uh, like Wayne said, ULA or not. Um, and keep in mind also that a ULA, uh, which stands for unlimited li uh, uh, license agreement, it doesn't actually mean unlimited. It only means unlimited in certain products in certain ways uh, that it spells out in your contract. Um, uh, we can even do a few things that Oracle itself doesn't offer, uh, such as net payment terms on your Oracle support uh, and itemized billing by department. Because we found over the years, uh, a lot of organizations do have trouble renewing their support. Uh, Oracle's pretty inflexible uh, about how they do it. Uh, and for a lot of organizations, uh, they want to divide that support up amongst their different, uh, the cost of that support amongst the different groups that are actually using within the organization. So that's something else we can help with. Um, and I'm going to quickly here take a look at some of uh, the questions that we had come in. Uh, and the first one is, can you, uh, what was BYOL? Uh, that stands for bring your own license. Uh, so what that effectively means is that uh, you have uh, you had a license that you were using on premise, uh, and that you then brought in uh, to use in the cloud. Uh, so that is uh, what BYOL stands for. Now, keep in mind you might have different um, requirements for the cloud. Uh, so, for example, uh, using an AWS server requires double the licenses uh, that the same server would be if it is on premise. Uh, the next question I had uh, was, could you explain what prop hosting is? Uh, Wayne, I will let you uh, take that one. Proprietary hosting is a uh, is an application that uh, someone has created internally, right? You've, you've had a developer inside your company or you paid a developer to develop it for you, um, for your company's use. And it is for use with your clients, okay? So... You've built it and, and, and the technology you've built it with is Oracle, typically Oracle database. Um, in that kind of a situation, um, and, and, and it's a SaaS, so that means the users access it from the internet, okay? So you have, most clients will you know, load up uh, processor licenses, right? Which processor license is supposed to be unlimited license, um, and they load up their application, and their users hit this application that they developed and they use it and they get value. The problem Oracle had with that, and this came about pretty heavily in 2012 timeframe, is that normally the way it's always existed in the past is you've taken a license and um, you take a software package and you develop it and you wanna send it to people, you, you build it, right? Which usually is across like a royalty type of thing. And then you ship it to the client to the user and user and they use it. And then the royalties get paid to Oracle. Well, Oracle um, is missing out on those royalties when somebody just loads up a processor license and gives access from the internet, which is the way most people deploy software. So they came up with this concept of proprietary hosting, which is, is meant for a one-to-many situation, right? So that means you didn't build it just for a single person, you built it for many clients. Um, and you are, and you developed it in-house, right? Because, and that's because usually when you buy something off the shelf, um, it's already kind of got royalties built into, it and it's also got specific, uh, specifically what you're able to do with it in it. Um, whereas with a proprietary hosting thing, it's really up to the client. And the, and a lot of that is asked about in what they call a PAR form that Oracle has people fill out, um. So it's, it's just a, it's a different kind of license. It's more of a concession on a, on a given license. And normally uh, Oracle wants you to have that when you put up the prop hosting solution, right? That's not always how it goes because some people have actually implemented prop hosting solutions before prop hosting was actually a term. But if they got audited today, they would be called out on it because they would be told that's prop hosting and they'd want you to read by the licenses. There's other ways that can be done that can avoid that. But, um, but that's essentially, you know, it's not as easy to explain because there's so many different ways people have deployed these, um, but that's, those, are the, those are the key points. Thanks, Wayne. 
Uh, another one has popped up. Uh, we have, my company is considering uh, a merger with another organization. Uh, will we be able to, when we purchase the, if we purchase the company, uh, will we have any problem with using their licenses that they have now? Yeah, the, um, this is why it's really kind of key to understand any language that's in your contracts. Um, because there may be some stipulations in there around mergers, particularly if it's a ULA contract. Um, and you would have to kind of go off of that. There are also, um, you know, some other kind of licenses that are enterprise licenses. They can be affected um, by, and, and usually there's something in contracts, we'll talk about it as well. But with enterprise licenses, they go by um, revenue or they go by um, employee, which would be an entire entity. Well, it's important to understand what the entity represents. So if you merge with somebody else, all of a sudden the entity gets much bigger. So um, first, Oracle has, um, many years ago, Oracle had language that enabled you to transfer the licensing to anybody. They had updated it years ago um, to basically disallow any transfer. And the reason they did this was because they want first right of refusal. Um, it's not that they won't allow you to use it um, after the merger. It's just that they want to understand, you know, are, are you combining, like if you've got one company that's got a ULA and the company you're merging with has a ULA, you try to combine them. Um, they may have an issue with it because they may feel that um, because of the, the situation of both companies and the way that they bought their licenses, that it, they may be getting too much value by combining it. So they may have something to say about how they would allow it. Um, but that's why it's, it's really kind of good to have that information, kind of you know, know it so that you'll know that the time comes, okay, there's some things we have to work out with this, but there's usually always something that has to get kind of worked out. Uh, yeah, and I, there's all kinds, I just jump in there. There's all kinds of things that will happen in that type of situation. Uh, we had an instance where one organization, um, they were purchased by another one and they were okay with the transfer, but it turns out the new, corp the new company was headquartered in uh, Germany and uh, the old company was headquartered in France and their licenses said, uh, you can only use these licenses in France. And now because your, uh, your corporate headquarters is Germany, we are considering you to be in violation. Uh, and we were able to work out a great deal where instead of having, uh, when the company called the Oracle sales rep, this Oracle sales rep said, oh yeah, I got a great solution for you. Buy all the licenses all over again. Well, obviously they didn't want to do that. Uh, we were able to work out a, a good deal for that organization where uh, they, instead of buying all the licenses all over again, uh, they simply purchased the additional contract term to allow them to use the licenses uh, in the country that, that where they were going to use them, save them millions of dollars. But uh, that's what we always like to say is, you know, it's really great to consult experts uh, if you run into problems like that. Speaking of that, I had to use this our last question here. Um, if I didn't get to your question, uh, I'm sorry, we're running out of time here, and it is um, we'll get you after the um, after the webinar. We'll we'll contact you directly uh, and make sure we get you the answer. And the last question I'm get to here is. Uh, we've had issues trying to get our tool to find all of our assets. Is this common? The answer is yes. Uh, in fact, the answer is it's becoming more common all the time. The, the problem with a lot of these tools is that to a security, to a cybersecurity system, they look really suspicious uh, because they're just going from server to server and place to place uh, asking, yeah, hey, what's here? What's going on? Uh, a lot. It's, it, it looks like malware type scanning. So it tends to, these tools get blocked. Uh, more and more now by cybersecurity features. Uh, and the problem is, is when they get blocked, they don't always tell you. Uh, and they don't always say, hey, I wasn't able to check out this entire server room over here uh, because I wasn't allowed in. And that we found that a lot of organizations, uh, when we start working with them, they're shocked to find out how much more assets they have in different places than they thought. And the most common reason we find is because uh, they were using the tool and the tool gave them a false sense of security. Uh, and I'm not saying that all tools are bad. There's some great ones out there. We use tools ourselves, um, but it is it, it can be dangerous to rely solely on the tool uh, without any sort of human expertise to back it up. Uh, so that's the issue we find. So with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, if you would like to talk to us after the event, uh, you can contact us at miroconsulting.com/contact. 
uh, you can call us at 732-738-8511, or you can email us at info at uh, Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.